Caring for Kids God's Way, a biblical counseling certificate program in child advocacy developed by the American Association of Christian Counselors through Light University. Your ministry is to be a Galatians 6-2 helper. Ours is to equip you with the highest level of advanced training from the world's leading Christian counselors. 24 experts teaming up to create the most comprehensive child studies curriculum for the personal classroom. May the Lord bless your study as you begin caring for kids God's way. Try to read a kid's mind. It's like a dramatic novel written in a foreign language. High school is difficult, you know, whether you're dealing with social pressure or academic pressure or um, just, I mean, anything. You know, you have a lot of stress on you, no matter who you are or what you do. And um, I think that we don't really know how to deal with that. And parents don't see that. They see high school as like a party, a time for us to party just because we enjoy having fun because we're kids and um, we still like to go and hang out and you know be social but um, high school is probably one of the hardest times you know I think once you get to college you have more of a sense of direction in high school you're pretty much lost. Uh, like a lot of rich kids in Arcadia um, just parents did like everything materially for them like got them everything they wanted nice cars and let them have parties and stuff, but I like, didn't have like a real relationship like in a, in a deeper way. Like, I don't know, a lot of them felt alone and that's why I saw like a lot of rebellion, a lot of like drinking or drugs. Most kids, they want a relationship with their parents, you know, they want to, you know, be able to talk with them or have conversations with them. And, um, you know, they want them to be their parents, but, you know, like, like friends, you know, and, um, and a, a lot of times nowadays, just parents are so busy with, like, work or, you know, coming home and they're tired or they have work when they get home, you know, it's just, you know, a lot of the kids, they don't spend that much time with their parents, you know, they just, I don't know, for me, it's, you know, that's what I like with my parents. Um, like a relationship, getting involved. Yeah, it helps because either you're a pretty boy, you're a gangbanger, or you're a jock. You ain't in any of those three, you ain't going to the school. Would be, a lot of the time adults think, especially in girls when they have like their little problems up there, petty little problems, and like sometimes they actually are big things and like a lot of times, like it's happened to me, it's happened to my friends. Like if you go to an, an, an adult or an older person, they kind of just say like, "Oh, it's high school, get over it." But it's kind of like when people say that, you have like, depending on what grade you're in, you have a year, two more years left. So it's kind of like you can't just get over it at the moment. So like it does matter to us, and like maybe we won't remember it in 30 years, but it's kind of like we're living now, so we do need to deal with it now. Get inside their mind. Caring for Kids God's Way presents Dr. Chap Clark, Associate Professor of Youth, Family, and Culture at Fuller Theological Seminary, pastor of Emmanuel Church in Burbank, California, and author of the book, Hurt Inside the World of Today's Teenager. Now here's Chap Clark with what modern kids believe. It is great to be with you to talk about where kids are today. I, uh, as you heard, I am a professor at Fuller Seminary and most of my adult life I've been spending trying to figure out who kids are and what it means to understand them, to walk with them, to serve them in the name of Christ. I am a parent of three kids myself and over the years I've done the best job that I possibly can to try to help the church take seriously young people and adolescents. And probably the first thing, the most significant thing I've recognized as I teach classes or do seminars to folks about where kids are is as we bring, begin to bring up different things that they're thinking about what they're experiencing and how they are, how they dress and how they act. An awful lot of people begin to go to how they feel about themselves in relationships to young people. I have been working with kids in various organizations and churches and, and I, I'm an old guy now. I'm, I'm, I know I look 49 on camera, but I'm actually 51. It's not, not 51, it's CHAP 5.1, the new version, as I attempt to try to care for kids. But I drive by a 7-Eleven or a Save-On and when I do, I see all those 14-year-old boys outside, standing around talking with each other, and something happens inside of me. 
uh, looking at kids in a mall or at a ball field. I don't know what goes on inside your head. Most adults are scared of kids. Most adults don't understand them. They're mad at them. They worry about what they think and how they act and how they talk. And so most of the time when we end up talking about young people and we, we talk about kids and where they are and who they are, we get these feelings inside of ourselves that often at best are a little uncomfortable and sometimes really negative. I'm not sure where you are when you think about young people. Are you uh, either individually or collectively, if you're watching this in a group, how do you feel when you think about young people in general? Well, I, I have to just tell you as we start off this, this particular time together that we're going to spend, we are not going to focus on us. We're not going to focus on what we think, what we feel, how upset we can get, uh, the things that bother us. We're not going to argue about our different perceptions or heal one another's disappointments when it comes to young people. Because it's really hard to be a kid today. That is the basic assumption and thesis of this entire time. I'm glad you're here to join us because what we're going to be looking at is to try to understand the changing adolescent culture in our world that has affected all of us. If we're honest, I think uh, we recognize that life is changing all around us at a rapid rate. And I'm not just talking about some of those isolated incidences like, like the wardrobe malfunction of the Super Bowl a few years ago that someone called kind of some kind of uh, problem with a costume that all of us were upset about and the NFL changed their policies to make sure they would never have something offensive like the Rolling Stones ever be on a Super Bowl halftime. These are, these are events that get our attention that cause us to wonder what's happening in culture. But I'm talking more if we get in a helicopter and go a thousand feet and we look down at the overall uh, trajectory of society. For example, a much more monumental event occurred on the MTV Awards just not that long ago, a couple of years ago, 2004, when Madonna and Britney decided they would kiss one another in a passionate embrace. It didn't get anywhere near the attention that the Super Bowl event did with Janet Jackson. But it was a much more monumental event in that it showed something that is far more prevalent in our culture now that wasn't just a few years before. If you take a look at the film 13, for example, or many of the modern films that talk about our actual life together, we will see things that we never could have imagined even 15 years ago. That is one of the reasons we have to take a look at adolescent culture. We have to slow down our lives long enough to step back and to take seriously that life is changing and it's affecting all of us and it's especially affecting our young. But here's the interesting thing. With every adult, I could, if I had a chance to be with you, I could show you a clip of a film or a TV show, play a song from an era in your life, just a few words of that song or notes. I could uh, have you smell some kind of fragrance, maybe brute or some other fragrance that would equate to your high school experience. And I could transport each one of you, whether you're 20 years old or you're 70 years old, back to your high school experience. I could take each one of us back to being 15 immediately. And another phenomenon that goes on with us is whenever we walk into a room, if you ever have the occasion to walk into a room, maybe it's part of your parole, where you walk into a room and you're, there's just high school kids everywhere. Here's what happens on the inside of every adult, 22 or 3 years old and older, all the way until those that are in their 80s. We are immediately transported back to that feeling inside of us of where do we fit, where is our group, who are the people we're comfortable with. And we take our own experience and we freeze it in time. And because we freeze our experience in time, and this is also true of the academy in terms of our training for therapists, youth workers, and pastors and others, even teachers, is we assume that life is static. We freeze it in time. We go back into a room of kids and we see the kind of students that we uh, didn't like in high school and so we shun them. We see a group of kids that were popular or more athletic or attractive than we were and we are intimidated by them. And we see those groups of students that are just about like us and we make a beeline for them. We feel safest with them. This is especially true with people that work with kids as youth workers, but I dare say that any adult, if they enter a room of adolescence, this is the experience we go through. 
But the expectation we take is, is that the culture of high school kids today is identical to the culture of high school kids when we were young. And that is simply not the facts. Life is changing and changing dramatically. So let's take a look at how it's changed. But as we do that, one thing I want us to be aware of is uh, to make sure everybody's on the same page. I am positive that most of you watching this, in fact, almost certainly, you who are watching this right now, you do not need the next five minutes of this because you have had the training in adolescent development and you understand the latest theories and understanding. So for all those other people that will also get access to this, I just have to get us on the same page. What exactly is adolescence? Now, I've asked this a lot. I, I teach graduate school, I do seminars, and even with friends and parents that I know. Uh, what is adolescence? We have synonyms. We have, in the church, we use this rather odd word that nobody else uses. It's called youth. Everybody else would say, if you're older like me, you'd say kids, really not meaning children, meaning someone 11 or 12 years old up into their mid to late 30s. <clears throat> and uh, perhaps use another word, uh, like you would talk about teenagers. And so we'll use things like preteen early adults. We have a lot of names and labels we throw around at random to describe a phase of life that most of us believe we understand, but we're just thankful we're out of it. So we need to take some time, if it's okay, to just ask the question, what is an adolescent? What is the process about? Well, the technical definition of adolescence has to do with that time in life between childhood and adulthood. That's the technical definition. Throughout all of time, in every single culture around the globe, there were two stages of life. There was childhood, there was adulthood. Children were the most significant and precious asset of any culture, society, or community, historically, before they got more and more institutionalized. In every culture around the globe, children were what made them uh, a society that could go on and on, because the thing that brought them together the most was their their story is a word I like to give to it. Really, uh, people that write about things like what's called a meta narrative, meaning grand story in this context. A community or society or culture's grand story, meta narrative, that incorporated all of their history, all of their stories, their music and, and songs and dance, all came out of this corporate story that held them together. And what was the most important thing to them? in every culture around the globe historically, was to pass that story on so that that binding connection, the rootedness of one another, would be carried on through generation to generation. We even see that in a few places in Scripture, that there are some psalms that talk about, I will pass uh, my truth on generation to generation. Well, that's uh, because adults saw children as their most precious asset. They were the ones to carry on the story. But as the centuries wore on and as cultures developed, each one got more and more institutionalized and often got more and more arrogant in their quest for power, corporate, national, ethnic, even personal desire for more influence, power, and to make their name in the world cause children to shift from being a precious asset of the community into being a tool at first and then ultimately people that got in the way of our dreams and desires as adults. Now it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's basically the history that led up into adolescence. Till about a hundred years ago, people started to recognize that we no longer have two stages of life. Most adults operate under the assumption that there are two stages of life and adolescence is merely fiction or a popularistic notion that we place on top of lifespan. That you're a child and then you kind of morph into adulthood. But virtually no one that studies development agrees with that and hasn't for an awful long time. About a hundred years ago we began to recognize we no longer have two stages. Adolescence, uh, children and adults. Children were precious and they were trained and taught and embraced and surrounded in order to assimilate them into adulthood. Over the centuries in Western world, we let go of our commitment to assimilation and to the training of our young. It became a nuisance, something we relegated to others, but it wasn't part of our central corporate calling. 
until around 100 years ago, we recognized that there's a new phase of life that had developed. It was the consequence of our abandonment of the young and our commitment to a corporate meta-narrative. I know those are big words, but it really is important for us because no longer do we have, even 100 years ago, systems and structures and uh, kind of a, a community-wide commitment to the young. And so therefore, adolescence was born 100 years ago. It really comes from a biological term, adolescere, which was used to describe two species, one morphing into another using kind of Darwin's theories of evolution. That's where it started. And then over the years, in the early part of the 20th century, people started to understand it more. And basically, here's what happened. When society no longer has as its primary focus to nurture and raise and assimilate its young, they're on their own to become an adult. So about 100 years ago, we finally had this phase of life that is, by definition, a group of people that are on their own to insert themselves into adult society. That's what adolescence is. It's marked by a kind of a fancy word, kind of a big word, and I only know three big words, but I'm going to share them with you to impress you as you're watching this tape. And is the big word individuation. Now, granted, that's kind of a kind of a word we don't use a lot, but if you just take off the T-I-O-N and put an L there at the end, it's the process of becoming a unique individual. That's what being an adolescent is. You went through it, no matter how old you are, and I've gone through it. Is the process of becoming a unique individual means that I somehow have to move from childhood where I'm dependent on my adult system and my parents or whatever adults raise me, ultimately to learn what it means to become interdependent as an adult and therefore to move from dependency as a child, where I am cared for and nurtured, hopefully, in most settings, I have to go through a process of learning how to become unique enough, confident enough to insert myself into interdependence in adult society. I move from dependence to interdependence. What individuation is, I know it's a big word, but think about this. It's the process of becoming a unique individual by becoming, here's the key, independent. Adolescence is the process of becoming independent to the point that I have the security and knowledge base to be able to insert myself into adult society. That, that's really what adolescence is. Now, roughly there are three tasks to this thing, three tasks of adolescence. You, you take a college course or graduate level course, you, you kind of understand that there's maybe five tasks if you read one book, or you read another book, there's seven tasks of adolescence. There's different layers and different looks at what adolescence is, but you can really summarize them into three different, three different tasks in adolescence, and you'll see them on your screen in just a minute. The first task of adolescence, these are not even sequential. These all three must happen simultaneously, but it's really a question. It has to do with our identity. Asking the question, as you see on this slide, who am I? One of the tasks of becoming a unique individual, unique person, is trying to figure out, who am I? And uh, there are a lot of folks that kind of say, we are the person we try on until something sticks. If you're an X-Men fan, it's kind of like the ultimate mystique, where I morph into all these different selves, and eventually some things kind of stick to me on the outside. Well, one of the reasons I'm grateful to be a part of this organization doing the taping and that's uh, bringing this series out, is that I believe that theologically, the scriptures don't teach that. That identity is not something that goes from the outside in. Identity is something that begins in God's mind through creation and comes to fruition in redemption. We are the person that God created us to be. So all of life, the quest for identity, asking the question, who am I, is getting all of those false messages out of the way. So who I am emerges, and I am able to live into the person that Jesus Christ created me to be. That's the quest for identity. Every single person, you and me, and all young people go through the process of individuation, asking the question, who am I? That's identity. Second one is autonomy, as you see on, on your screen. Autonomy is kind of, has to do with power. Maybe a question associated with it would be, do I matter? Do my choices matter? How much power do I have? What some scholars talk about is a, 
is kind of a fancy concept called a locus of control, which really means headquarters of control in terms of what I control. And uh, a child has their locus of control is external. It's in their family system. An adult, hopefully, has an internal locus of control. It's where my headquarters of my decision making and how I live my life are internalized. I move from dependency on my family to define not only who I am and identity, but also they control me, which is a good thing. As an adult, I'm expected to control my own life. I don't play the blame game. I don't expect others to fix my problems. I may need others in interdependent relationships. That's different. But I take responsibility for how I respond to life circumstances. Well. That's the second task of adolescence. Not only do I need to ask, who am I? But I need to ask, what kind of power do I have? How, how do I influence my world? Um, do my choices make any difference and matter in the grand scheme of things? And the third is up there on your screen as well. And that is this whole concept of belonging. With the question, where do I fit? Where is my home? Where is my community? We are all created to live in the context of community, a group of people that we're, where we can know and be known, where we can love and be loved, where we can serve and be served, where we interdependently rely on one another as boys and girls, men and women, in the context of warm, intimate relationship. And what we believe as followers of Christ is under the dependency of the Father who does love us. But we're all brothers and sisters. We're all boys and girls in God's kingdom. Jesus said in Mark 10, <clears throat> Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And part of the concept of that, uh, if you really unpack that, is that we're the same. I, one of the nice things about getting old is, is I, you know, I'm 51 now and I'm starting to feel it a little bit. I know I still look, you know, incredibly you know, together, but that's because that's the wonder of modern technology and cameras. But if you look close, you'd realize, no, the guy's getting older. There's one difference between me and you if you're 50 or 60 or 70 and a sixth grader. You and I are no different than sixth graders at the core of who we are. We are all sixth graders lost looking for our locker. Every one of us. But here's the reality. There's one difference. It's called gravity. It's just the weight of the world on our souls, on our backs, on our faces. See, that's one of the things Jesus really wanted to tell us. We have fragmented our society. We have segmented ourselves out of context, relationships, and community. And young people go through this thing called adolescence, asking, where do I fit? Who's my people? Especially in the United States, if, you, if this is the country you're seeing this in, we're the grand individualistic experiment. We are the country whose meta-narrative is primarily this. I have the right to do whatever I want to do. And in some ways, that's wonderful. But in other ways, we are created for taking that right and exercising it by living together and learning how to care for one another. That's the basic human drive. Every culture, every society around the globe, two stages of life, childhood, adulthood. But now we've created something called adolescence, where with these three, three tasks, they are on their own to figure out who they are what they control, and how do they take power, and then where they fit, and they've got to insert themselves. Here's the last key of this one. Even 50 years ago, up until about 40 or 50 years ago, you are born into community. You were accepted and embraced by community because you lived in community, because you were part of us and you knew it. Then out of that freedom, out of that understanding of life, you performed, you lived, you moved, you acted, you worked, you played, you did sports, because it came naturally out of who you were, embraced and accepted by the people around you. Here's the biggest shift, is that we've moved where today you have to produce or perform in order to somehow find community. It's true of all of us. We've all inherited this development of adolescence. And that's what it's about, those three tasks. Now, not only with those tasks, let's just talk about timing for a minute. Uh, like, let's say 100 years ago when we first identified adolescence, really adolescence is said to begin in biology. It comes from the Latin word pubertal, which means puberty. Uh, excuse me, which means uh, adulthood. Pubertal means adulthood. Throughout all of time, 
biological adulthood coincided with actually chronological adulthood. Roughly the average age of puberty is the same age that people entered adulthood. Sometimes with rituals and rites of passage, most of the time highly organic and kind of natural. Uh, but when Stanley Hall, who's the first guy to label this thing adolescence that we know about, uh, adolescence really began average age of puberty in a culture, about somewhere, depending on who you read, 14, 14 and a half, maybe even older. When were you an adult? When, when did you know who you were? When were you ready to take on adult responsibility, autonomy, and when were you ready to fit into society? Roughly about 16 years old. Adolescence, when it first began, as we look back on it, was really a two-year period. Fast forward to 1970, average age puberty. Now then you've got to ask the question, what, what do you mean average age puberty? Uh, how do you measure that kind of thing? There are people that get, I'm not kidding, doctorates, master's degrees, go on TV, studying all this stuff, writing on it, on the average age historical, historically of puberty. And it's a very weird thing because what scholars have discovered, it's very frustrating, is there's an, we got no evidence, zero, of the average age of male puberty. None. There is no way to figure out the average age historically of male puberty. We just don't know, and, and I think there's probably two reasons for it. One is, is guys lie, and secondly, guys just don't want to talk about it. Men, historically, and in our culture, don't want to talk about stuff like that. Tell me when you hit puberty. Now, you ask a guy that, a man, now you don't have to do it right now, you're probably a little uncomfortable even with this. Guys get uncomfortable about stuff like this. Puberty is not when your third grade son goes, look, I've got an 18 inch armpit here, I'm hitting puberty, you know, and you grab it and you pull it out, no you're not. No, that's not puberty. Puberty is, let's be official and kind of serious about this, puberty is marked by a physiological expression or episode that, that marks your ability uh, to participate in fertilization. Now you could write that down, I think you know what I mean. Puberty is marked by some kind of external episode that says you're ready for fertilization. Now we kind of know that most men or even, even scholars are kind of upset by that. We have no idea what men's average age of puberty is. Doctors guess there's not enough evidence. But women love to talk about this and they have historically. Average age of female puberty we can mark. I mean you go back 200 years you see letters from mothers to their daughters or mothers to their families overseas saying guess what happened to Mary Lou and give an exact date. You can go back 500 years and see diary entries. 2,000 years you can see it in clay tablets. Uh, you can go to the walls of pyramids. You can go back to a dinosaur footprint right next to it. Guess what happened to Mary Lou. I'm not kidding. You can go back and see hundreds of studies of the average age female puberty. Why? Because it changes according to society. Most people don't understand that, but it does. The timing of female puberty changes according to environment. That's not what we're here to talk about, but it affects this whole thing called adolescence, because here's the key. Average age of female puberty in any society is the average age that both boys and girls start asking those three questions. Do you get that? Average age of female puberty is the, is the age that the boys and girls in that community start asking. So in 1900, it was roughly 14 and a half or so. Both boys and girls start in entering adolescence. 1970, let's fast forward. Average age, female puberty, dominant culture U.S., about 13 years old, roughly. When were you an adult in 1970? When did you know who you were, ready to take responsibility, and you inserted yourself in society? Roughly 18, graduation from high school. Let's shift now to, let's say, 2006, 2007. Average age female puberty for us right about now, depending on who you read, is somewhere between 11 and a half and 12 years old. And it's declining. Weird thing is, it's happening not only in the US, happening in Canada, happening in Mexico, Buenos Aires. It's happening in Honolulu, Seoul, Korea, happening in Singapore, Berlin, Moscow, Nairobi, the, the ends of the earth, Des Moines. I mean, it's happening everywhere around the world that the average age of female puberty is going down. This is a very serious thing, and we've got to understand it and study it. There's a lot of theories out there, but we're not going to take a look at that now. Roughly 11 and a half or 12 years old is when adolescence starts. When is it over today? Now remember, what is our criteria? Criteria is <clears throat> asking the question, who am I? Asking the question, am I ready to take on adult responsibility, exert power, and not play the blame game, and ready to insert myself into adult society? Well, virtually everybody 
everybody reports that for women it's mid to late 20s. That adolescence goes, according to those three questions, mid to late 20s. For guys, as some say mid to late 40s, a completely different issue. But mid to late 20s, you think 12 years old to 25, to 25 or 27. 1970, 13, 18, five year period. 19, 2006 or seven, roughly 11 and a half or 12 to mid to late 20s, 15 year period. Shifting from 1970, 35 or more years, from a five-year period of adolescence into a 15-year period where I have no idea who I am, I don't know what I control, and I have no idea where I fit. Adolescence has changed dramatically. The last thing I need to say on this is we recognize that even in adolescence there are stages. I like to use a tightrope. You see on your screen right now, kind of a tightrope. 1970, the tightrope would be you see the pole on the left side of your screen is a pole of childhood where you have the support of your family system. On the right side of your screen, a pole of adulthood. And in 1970, adolescence was a five-year period or so. Well, to move from childhood to adulthood, by definition, you have to go across it alone. Adolescents are going across a tightrope by themselves during the process of adolescence and individuation. By definition, they have to go alone. People could help them and support them on the pole on the way up. People could help them and support them on the pole on the way down. From dependency to interdependency, in order to become independent, you are traversing a tightrope. I just use that metaphor a lot because it seems to describe this perfectly and beautifully. Now, for a long time, we've had two stages of adolescence. And so you who are 30, 35 and older, you probably experienced adolescence as a two-stage process. There's early adolescence and late adolescence, 1970 to 75. Early adolescence, roughly 13 to 15, roughly 7th and 9th-ish grade. Late adolescence, about 10th grade to 12th grade for most kids. Early adolescence has always been marked by kind of concrete thinking about life and relationships. It's kind of all about me, but I don't have the abstract thought yet. So if you like me, I like you, and I'm okay. Uh, late adolescence is really marked more by abstract thinking, but also abstract relationships, where I'm I'm more about the other. I, I'm aware of the other, and I'm trying to figure out how to connect with the other and have the other connect to me, but I'm still an adolescent. So an early adolescent, a way to describe it is, is, is you are, you know, you're like a seventh grader or so. In other words, you, your feet are bigger than your parents, and uh, you really can't find your math book. That's early adolescence. Late adolescent is, I am ready to take on the world. I can conquer anything. I've got all the information I need. Nobody else knows more than me. And this summer, I'm going to go to Europe. I need 500 bucks, and would you pay my cell phone bill? See, that's late adolescence. I'm ready to insert myself in the society I want, but I'm not ready to take responsibility for it. I'm more abstract in my thinking. Now, that was up until about 10 years ago. Here's the biggest shift, and this is where we're going to be going the rest of this tape. Most of us are aware with almost everything I've said so far, but we have to understand that to go where we're going to go. And that is this. There are now three stages of adolescence. There are no longer two stages. As adolescence is lengthened, 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 it stretched that tightrope to the point that something had to pop in the middle. And what popped was what scholars called mid or middle adolescence. They started talking about this a lot a little over 10 years ago, roughly mid-90s, where they describe that there is a stage of life called mid-adolescence, but nobody really studied it. And you see the slide on your screen for a book that that's what I did. I studied mid-adolescence called Hurt Inside the World of Today's Teenagers. I had a research team. We did a started in one part of the country, and then we did studies all across the U.S. and Canada to try to figure out where really kids are. We're trying to understand what's happening in their world. And here's the biggest distinction, and then I'll unpack this the rest of our time is no longer there are two stages where there's early and there's late. Early, concrete thinking and relationships. Late, uh, abstract thinking and relationships. Now middle adolescence has popped up. Here's the term that I use. It's not out there in many books or journals yet. Hopefully it will be soon because people seem to resonate with this. Egocentric abstraction. Egocentric abstraction means this. I am aware of other people my impact on them, their impact on me. But during this season of life, 
I don't have the energy to care very much. Most of life centers around me and my protection to somehow make it through life. That's where they are. So if you're dealing with a kid who is 11, 12 years old, they're just entering early adolescence. It's not all that different from somebody entering early adolescence 50 years ago, 30 years ago. They hit about ninth grade, they shift into middle adolescence. Roughly about 15 goes to about 20 or 21 years old. And then they shift into late adolescence going to the mid-20s. Interesting thing is, is that we have to be prepared to deal with young folks and to have compassion on them in each one of these three stages because it's very different for all of them and their experience is different. One of the worst things you can ever say to a high school kid today, any adult, is high school is the best time you will ever have in your life. In our study, universally, every single kid said, in a very detailed, what's called ethnographic study, kids said, that's one of the cruelest things they've ever heard. Because this, if this is as good as it gets, I want nothing to do with this thing called life. And that was universal. Our response in our focus groups, 12 official focus groups around the US, one, 11, the US, one in Canada, was universal in that particular sentiment. And what happened? So let's take a look at how adults have shifted in terms of viewing adolescence. Let me just use some examples and why this has occurred, why adolescence is lengthening, what's happening within the context of mid-adolescence, why culture's changing so rapidly. Well, it seems like this. You, you take, for example, let's use a straw man, youth sports. Youth sports builds, if I leave the statement blank, you would all say, or you would say personally, character. Youth sports builds character. That's the rhetoric of the 40s and 50s. First Little League baseball team was 1938. Why? To teach kids how to enjoy the grand game that is our national pastime. National pastime, a, a phrase of meta narrative. Well, if we teach kids baseball, let's have them enjoy the game, have them build character, enjoy each other, try out different positions, play against different friends, and shift up everything because developmentally the reason I play youth sports is to enjoy the game and learn how I fit in this game that's known as my national pastime. Fast forward to today, youth sports is no longer about the kids. It's no longer about each kid having the greatest enjoyment. Whether, it forcing, whether it's forcing uh, all-stars on four, five, six, seven-year-old t-ball kids, where we tell some kids, hey, you're six years old, you need to realize you're a loser. These two kids, they're the all-stars, they're the athlete at six years old. Not only adolescent child development, but physical development tells us that a six-year-old kid that's clumsy could be an all-star college athlete. But see, our systems have shifted. They're not about developing kids anymore. We, we dress up eight, nine, ten-year-old boys to play football, for example. They may weigh 55 pounds. We put a 20-pound helmet on them, and we say, go hit somebody, son. They look like a giant Q-tip running out there in the field. They don't know what it means to hit somebody developmentally. And we yell at them, and we scream at them, and we videotape the whole thing. We give them extra tutors for all these sports. It is not about kids anymore. Don't have a lot of time to unpack this. Pick up a newspaper. Go buy a youth ball field and see if that doesn't sound accurate. That I'm not talking about individual coaches, individual players or parents. I'm talking about getting into a helicopter and looking what's changed. Is it 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we gave you sports to kids to nurture them, to care for them, to give them the opportunity to experience the fullness of life. What's changed is no longer about kids. It's now about the adults in charge. Let's take education. <clears throat> education, I, I'm committed to education. I want to publicly make sure that's on a tape like this. Uh, many of my family members are involved in education as teachers and administrators. I myself went to school. I am very proud of education. But in my study, uh, where I was on a high school campus for eight months, kind of studying kids, using the role of substitute teacher, which is interesting. You can look at the book and see more about that if you want to. Uh, I discovered a lot about the educational system. Where high school education became mandatory in the U.S. in the 1930s, in order, if you look back and see why people wrote the things they did about why we should have high school, it's because kids needed to be assimilated. They didn't use those words, but they talk about we have to train individual students. Today, high school, junior high school, even elementary school, is about test scores, 
teachers unions, government officials competing with Jap Japan, Germany, and other parts of the world. It's become fighting between parents and teachers and administrators and school boards. Everybody is upset. Everybody's pushing the blame around. Who are the losers in our system? I'm not blaming teachers. But look 50 years ago at education and how kids were individually nurtured and cared for as we sought to train them and assimilate them. Now education is about all the adults in charge, no longer about kids. Even in the church, which is what I teach, youth ministry. I teach youth ministry at Fuller, youth family and culture is my title. And even in the church, we have created a ministry that's much more about activities and programs and getting kids to like it than it is about helping the kids to see that this church is their family and their home. And I've participated in this too, and youth workers know this. And they're all working on it, trying to figure it out. Is if 30 kids normally come and 20 show up, we say, where is everybody? And those 20 say, even here in the church, I'm a number. And lastly, even the family. For those of you that are therapists or work with families, church, secular society, the family used to be a relatively stable institution. Granted, there were problems back in the 50s and 40s in the family. But still, to a young person's belief and psyche, the family was the most solid of institutions. And today, the family is seen as something that is uh, highly, uh, pot has a high potential of disintegrating right before their eyes. Whether it's a couple that's a Christian couple, been together forever, and all of a sudden one partner says, I'm done. Or whether it's kids that come home and want their, need their parents to say, we are here for you, and then the parents, all they know how to do is to hammer them on grades or expectations or performance or weight or body image, or you name the list. Whether it is the sports and activities, education, the church or the family or any system or structure, individual, act, I mean institution or organization that originally sought to care for kids, what's happened? They've abandoned their young. We, I, you, have added to systemic abandonment of our young. We have ripped away from them any support system that's going to help them to assimilate into adulthood, which has caused adolescents to lengthen. It's not about spoiled kids. It is about kids that have been left behind. The common argument is, wait a minute, I drive my kid to, to soccer. They play competitive soccer. They want to. They're eight years old. So I drive them three times a week to competitive soccer. Sure, I have to miss church twice a month. That's the price we pay because my kid wants to be in competitive soccer. My friends, we need to help people to see an 8-year-old wants to be cared for. A 13-year-old wants to know they have a safe place. A 17-year-old wants to be judged and included and embraced because of who they are and not how they look, how they do in school, or how they perform in the athletic field. 100% of kids in our focus groups, 100%. I called my professor where I got my doctorate and said, you said this isn't supposed to happen. 100% said we have been abandoned or wounded by adult systems and therefore we don't trust any adults. We don't respect adults. We have been hurt by systems that have hurt us. And that's where we kind of bring this thing to a close. We really need to talk about where they are now in order for us to understand what we're called to do and to be with them. First observation is this. And studying kids during this a couple of years ago, this study and continuing to study around the world with a team of researchers, is kids have built their own world beneath. That's what happened in 1995-ish. As, as culture began to take youth more seriously in the 30s and 40s and late 40s, we started to develop uh, the inklings of youth culture. We all walked in one large landscape together, but as youth culture began to develop, even through the 40s and early 50s, we had this little pathway called youth culture. But at the time, adults could walk in the pathway with kids. Over the years, youth culture became more about an expression of their experience in life and their desire for having their own unique identity. As adults more and more abandoned them and fragmented themselves, out of the life of kids, kids began to take more and more control of their own life. Thus, advertisers and media folks responded. It's not the media's fault. They responded to our society. And we developed youth culture. It became pretty soon 
a well-worn path. And then through the late 60s and early 70s, it became kind of a ditch. Through the 80s, became a trench. Those of you that are old enough will remember if you're in helping services, therapists, educators, uh, youth ministry folks, you know in the 80s up till about 1992 or 3, we were saying, we got a problem. Our kids are hurting bad and they're distant from us. That trench of youth culture, right around 1995, the same time people wrote on middle adolescence emerging, adolescence lengthening, kids said, phooey on you guys. They grabbed each other, they went underground. I call it the world beneath. They created their own world. Early adolescents don't have their own world. They developmentally still trust that adults can care. By the time they hit mid-adolescence in today's society, roughly about ninth grade, is they grab onto each other and it lasts roughly until 20, 21 years old now, where they live in a world beneath. It's their own world with its own rules and value systems, with its own hierarchy of relationships, with its own self-supporting system. It's Lord of the Flies. It's the same roots of African-American spirituality. It's what's happening in second-generation Latinos all across southwestern United States. Any oppressed or discarded people group, God has built into us a desire to survive, so we grab onto each other and we will pull away from the mainstream and we'll create our own culture and society to protect ourselves. Well, a mid-adolescent doesn't have the developmental capacity to do that out of a sense of health and specific commitment to the whole, they simply are trying to survive. That's why it's egocentric abstraction in mid-adolescence. They go to the world beneath, and in the world beneath is where they care for each other and they survive. Now, what happens in the world beneath? Every kid, every kid has to come up for air. Every kid's got to show up at school. They got to go play sports, activities, deal with parents, go to church have relationships with all those folks on that adult landscape up above. And so what do they do? They live in layers. Here's how adolescent development's working now. It's, if you can imagine a house with multiple layers around it, there's a window in each, in each little uh, side of that house. And for an adult or even a late adolescent, their identity is a single candle in the middle of this house. So we compartmentalize by opening the shutters to some of our windows. And we may have a window of work where we know them at work and we come and we peer into somebody's life and we see that candle of identity. That's who they are. Then we see them with their spouse and we look at that same candle. Oh, I see it, get a fuller picture of who they are. A mid-adolescent, by definition, does not yet have their core identity developed. So therefore, they put a candle in each window, a different candle. And a kid is a completely different person in every layer of their life in order to survive that layer. They come up from the world beneath where they believe it's the safest, where they say, the only people that know me are my friends. They'll even say to parents, you don't even know me, which can hurt parents and really make a dent in family relationships. So they go into geometry class and they try to figure out what are the teacher's expectations, which is actually secondary, what are the friends' expectations? How can I best survive this in light of everything? And I, and I live a person. I live a role in this particular setting. So then I go to chemistry, and I'm a different candle. I go to sports, and I'm a different candle. I go to youth group, and I'm a different candle. That is mid-adolescence. What we need to learn from that is that the window we look through is not the whole picture of the young person because systemically they've been raised in a culture that has abandoned them. Not only do they live in layers, but they grab onto each other in clusters. They build these intense friendship groups called clusters. Cliques are late adolescents where you're testing the waters of community. Clustering doesn't occur in early adolescence. You're just friends. But in mid-adolescence, they grab onto each other and they become a family-like group. Now, my thesis is they are not true friendships because true friendships presupposes self some kind of self-sacrifice for the other. A mid-adolescent egocentric abstraction is in the cluster relationships, not for what they can give to it, but it's relationships of necessity. It's your wingman. It's somebody to watch your back. It's to find a sense of identity and protection in the world beneath and the world outside. This has spillovers all over the place. 
Studies have been done about cheating, for example. A couple of years ago, a study was done that said 70-something percent of kids, 76 percent of kids cheated last year in high school. It's not 76 percent. It's 100 percent statistically. Yeah, there's some outliers, but statistically, it's every kid because cheating needs to be defined as if I ever help my friend cheat, I have myself cheated. When you ask young people about that, they say that's not cheating because I'm protecting my friend. A teacher was unreasonable giving a quiz when my friend had to do volunteer work for three hours yesterday to graduate. I will protect my friend over every other situation and institution that I find, which is why almost every single kid will lie to their parents at some point during mid-adolescence. And most of them lie a lot and really well. I'm not trying to scare you, and I'm not trying to somehow disparage kids. I don't believe it's their fault. It's what we've handed them with abandonment. It's the consequence of systemic abandonment. Sexuality, partying, drug use, not about those things. It's about loneliness, disconnection, trying to find a sense of celebration. Sexuality, there's a great series on that with the AACC, but sexuality is about loneliness and lack of connection. No wonder kids are so deeply involved in sexual activity and behavior from very young ages. 11, 12, 13 year old kids uh, in, in great numbers are participating in oral sex parties without any sense of morality or that that's wrong. And so lastly, however, here's the problem with kids that you all need to understand is even though they're in layers and they look like they're doing great and they get the sheen of hardness and disinterest and defensiveness about them, they're not. David Elkind said 20 years ago, this is the most stressed generation in history. He has said that even more recently in his updated book, The Hurried Child, in 2001. And my results in these subgroups and in conversation following is that kids say, I am deeply wounded, I am hurt, and I'm afraid of being alone. The phenomenon of cutting, the issues of unbelievable stress, of exhaustion, of the wild busyness to keep the machine of my life going, the distrust of adult systems because I've been abandoned. What's the solution? Is we need to sit on the steps of the world beneath. We need to come alongside kids and be their advocate without a self-serving agenda. We need to somehow let them know that there are adults who care. Even in the midst of this wild fragmentation and this lengthening adolescence where it seems like nobody's there for me, we need to stand beneath that that tightrope and look up and let them know that there are people in their church, in their schools, in their families that do care for them. Because we have handed them a world where they're on their own to become an adult and it's becoming more and more difficult. I just want to finish with the idea of what we do. Every kid needs five adults to become a healthy, individuated adult. They need five people that know their name, that will look them in the eye, and that will be their fan. Not a fan for how they look or how they perform, but will be a fan that says, I value you because you are part of me. Welcome to my community. In this culture, kids' behavior, performance, how they look, how they disengage, and how they try to protect themselves causes more and more distrust and fragmentation generationally. It is up to us as adults to bridge the gap and not expect kids to bridge it to us. That's why we have the problem we do. Will you care for one kid? One that will allow you to sit on the steps and hear their story. That's the current state of today's adolescent culture. Thanks. I know with a lot of my friends, parents hand out labels the same way. Like if you're at a friend's house and they're going out Saturday night, and they say, don't go out with him, that kid, he kind of looks like a stoner or something like that. And I go to a private school too, so kids have a lot of money there. And when they have a lot of money to throw around and do what they want with. And so images get set up around the school and those group of kids are stoners or those kids drink. So it's kind of like, if you're getting told what you do, 
then what's stopping you from doing it? So I think a lot of the time the labels that people put on the kids is what makes the kids those kind of people. Because it's kind of like if they've already given up hope in you or whatever they want you to do, then why stop doing it? People are involved in so many different things, like I'm in competition choir, she's in cheerleading. So your life is taken up by other things, and so you forget to do a homework assignment. Oh shoot, it's due tomorrow instead of Wednesday. Well, instead of, I guess, well, you could go to the library during lunch and do it, but you could also just like ask for, oh, could I see your paper? It's a, I don't know, it's <clears throat> easier just to ask someone, oh, can I see your paper, and just pop down the answers. So, and I feel like people don't see that as much as cheating was as, cheating on a test is more dramatic than, oh, let me just copy your paper. So I think that's where it ranges, where it, they say it's 70% named up for like cheating on tests or bigger things. But now it's like, oh, I was absent yesterday, can I just copy your paper? Like, I don't want to have to go and make it up. A lot of the time, like, I, I know my friends do this, like, they lie to their parents, like, not because, like, they're doing something really bad, but just because their parents are going to, like, misinterpret it and, like, automatically assume that they're, like, a bad kid and then just, like, okay, if I were to tell my parents, like, oh, I'm going to a party tonight, they'd be like, what? And they'd, like, make all these assumptions and it would just get really messy, so I'm not going to say, like, I constantly lie to my parents, but I always do tell some form of the truth. I mean, like, also, like, oh, we're not sure what we're doing yet, I'm just going to go hang out with you my friends and that really is what we're going to do, like whether or not we end up going to a party, whether or not we end up doing this or that, it's just kind of like, a lot of the times parents, they jump to conclusions, so you don't exactly feel comfortable saying what you're really doing, I guess. Drama definitely causes a lot of stress. <laughs> um, there's always drama with girls which is the most stressful thing, more than academics and sports. <laughs> um, I agree that stress does come from all different angles at once, it seems like. Um, but I think the hardest thing is that you are known for your accomplishments in high school. You're known for, um, for guys if you made the varsity team or you know, if for the girl, if you made, you know, the cheer squad or something. Um, nobody knows you just for having a good personality or for being a caring person. Drinking. Or drinking, you know, because while you're doing that, it makes them happy. At that, you know, in that moment, it makes them happy. And I don't know, like, just people that, kids that I know just, I'll be like, you know, why don't you stop or can I help you stop or, and they'll say, you know, I'm going through a tough time right now or something like that to those lines and, and, um, but really it's just hurting them because, you know, they think or, or during that time they enjoy it, they make it happy, it takes away their family problems, whatever problems they're having. It's just a quick, it's just the easy escape, you know? It's like a shortcut. Mm -hmm.